<laughs> you do the soy boy face. Welcome to the Three Padres and a Shepherd podcast, where three North Dakota Lutheran pastors and a real life shepherd combine serious theology with fun laughter. This is a podcast from the local church and for the local church. However, the local churches of these three pastors do not take any responsibility for the banter, foolery, and assertions that will follow. Welcome to the Three Padres and a Shepherd podcast. On today's episode of Three Padres and a Shepherd, we ask the question, what is evangelism and what is it not? Is evangelism standing on the corner of a street while yelling into a microphone? Is evangelism traveling to Africa on a mission trip to dig a well? Is evangelism following a scripted program that is presented to a neighbor as if you're trying to sell them a new set of Teflon cooking bowls? Is evangelism canceling church and then having a congregation go out and rake leaves in a particular town? And what about the Great Commission from Matthew 28? Where does that come into play? Stick around and we will answer these questions a lot more on today's episode of What is Evangelism and What is It Not? How's it going, guys? Going all right. Tablet on cooking bowls? Yeah, right. Is that even a thing? It wasn't the show of Napoleon Dynamite. If you guys recall. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so <Sold> Teflon bowls. <laughs> I don't know. I was just trying to think, that, you know, is it a sales? Is evangel- Man, I got to say evangelism. I got to slow down when I say that. Evangelism, is it like a slick sales technique? And we'll probably get into that a little bit later that uh, it's not. Obviously, it's not. So what else well, is new? How's sheep farming? <clears throat> Hauled the last of the sheeps out, out. The last of the sheeps with mothers out to the pasture the other day. And then... Uh, uh, just have a f- 10 bum lambs living on the front deck right now. My wife has, uh, <clears throat> instead of keeping the lambs in, she just fences the flowers out. So there's there's like baby gates and stuff set up around the flower pots in the front yard. And those things are impossible. <laughs> what is a bum lamb? Uh, a motherless lamb. Mm-hmm. A lamb that they're, my wife is, or the kids are feeding every day. Milk, they feed milk replacer and pellets too and and they are the most um they're <clears throat> no amount of abuse can untame a lamb once they have been bummed you can't kick them enough to make them go away uh they cannot be untamed <laughs> so, so they they're be- they're they live on the de- they live right up in front of the house now no well, mu- no fence can little. contain them and no abuse can untame them so. They're cute for the time being, though. That that wears real thin real fast. <laughs> <laughs> Are you all so, going to eat them next spring? I can save you one, but no, we'll 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 kick them out in the pasture shortly, and then we'll sell them uh, sell them with the rest of the lambs. You don't want to keep them around; they they need to go down the road. <laughs> we're, ta- we're talking before we we hit record on this, looking at your uh, all of our comparing our offices, and we look at your place. Uh, just give a give for the listeners, the viewers, a little shot of your shop there. It's pretty cool, Bo. There's Got a big just, heavy tractor and a bobcat, some WD forty, right? Man, there's a couple. There's another tractor you can't see because of the glare of the lights and pickup and four wheeler, but it just looks like work. Is what it looks like. <laughs> WD forty, right? That's all a man needs. Duct tape, WD forty. What else? Bailing wire, mm-hmm. bailing wire. Sometimes bailing wire. duct tape doesn't quite work. Yeah. Zip ties. I think that uh, the zip tie is the most underappreciated thing. Farm all farming would cease in North America without zip ties. <laughs> People would starve. <laughs> nice. <laughs> You're not wrong about that. I'm not wrong. I know I'm not. No. How, have you had to fix your four wheeler fenders with zip ties yet? No, just snowmobile hoods and pickup bumpers. Yep, you drill holes and zip tie together, right? Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. So what oh, else is man. new in your neck of the woods, Neuendorf? Uh, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to, I've i tried the game of jacks. Um, I was meeting with my ladies last week, and uh, they were talking about games they used to play on the playground during recess, and they used to play marbles and jacks. 
And so um, I found a, a set of jacks at Walmart, bouncy ball and 10 jacks. And I tried playing. I thought, how can anybody do this? It was so difficult. Do you know how to play jacks? No. You, so no. You, you, no. you have your 10 jacks laid out. You toss the ball. And before it bounces twice, you grab one of the jacks and catch the ball. And if you miss the ball, it's a foul. Or if you don't get one of the jacks and catch it in time, that's a foul. And it's really challenging if you haven't done it to pick up a jack and catch the ball before it bounces a second time. Uh, so you do that for each of the 10 jacks, and then you do two at a time, and then three at a time, and so on until you get all 10 jacks. But um, awesome. sounds like you have to be an athlete. All the most. Well, <laughs> I, I'm no athlete, but after a few minutes of practice, I was able to get all of my jacks and uh, played it with my daughter, and we made it all the way through 10s. We Probably cheated a, a lot, huh? but... Mm -hmm. Are those little jacks, little, are they a little sharp or no? They're just pieces of metal, right? Well, they're not really sharp exactly, but you wouldn't want to step on one or drive over one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> How about you, Bradmar? Anything new? Uh, just summertime. Kids are in baseball. Got five bottle calves that we're feeding out. Chickens are just about ready to butcher. We should have them in the freezer by the next time I see you guys, which will be nice. I'll nice. save one for you, Neuendorf. I'll let you come finish them off yourself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nice. How about well, the bees? How are the bees? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. the bees are are doing really well, actually. It's been such a mild spring. There's so much stuff in bloom that I've already put supers on the top, so they are making honey. And since this is uh, – I've gotten far enough now that all my comb is drawn out on the frames, so I don't. they don't have to build honeycombs. They just have to fill them up. So uh, yeah, the bees are doing great, and I should I should have a good amount of honey this year compared to last year. So this is good. So the birds and the bees are working out just fine. That's yep. right, they are. Now that we've <laughs> learned about those from noon or from Bradmeyer, we can move on. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry you had to learn about them from me, but at least you learned about them. <laughs> so yeah, three three padre or yeah yeah three padres, a shepherd, and a beekeeper, right? Yeah. <laughs> An addendum add that on to that. <laughs> Oh, man. I, I I think I'll stick with my day job. There you go. All right. Main topic time, you guys. Let's do it. Well, for this episode, I uh, sent you guys an email this morning. I don't know if you had a chance to read it or not, but uh, here's here's what we're doing. Uh, we're going to tackle this idea of evangelism, but probably what we should do is we should start with what is the gospel. Now, that should be obviously a given, but we, we want to redefine that or define it for our listeners to make sure we're on the same page. So what is the gospel? And then once we define the gospel, we should maybe talk about this idea of missions. That word mission has been used a lot in a vernacular in the church. So what is missions? What is it not? Then we'll get to the subject of evangelism. What is it? What is it not? And then maybe at the very end, as we wrap all this together, why evangelize? What, what's, what's the purpose of evangelism? Why would we even consider doing it? Uh, and so forth. So what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news, the glad tidings of great joy, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing in him, we have life in his name because he has shed his blood on the cross to redeem us from sin and death, and he has been raised again from the dead for our justification. And the word gospel comes from the Greek evangelion, uh, which comes from the element eu, or good, and angelion is um, announcement or news or tidings. that has that word angel or angel in it, so an angel is an announcer for God. It's the Evangelion is the good news specifically concerning Jesus. And that comes into English by way of Old English, which is a form of German, uh, God spell. God meaning good and spell meaning tidings or news. So the God spell or gospel is the Evangelion, the good news of Jesus Christ. Boom, that's great. Can you guys add to that? I mean, that's that's epic. 
Brad and I took the, wor- took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah, yeah, that's what yeah, I was yeah. thinking. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. Good stuff. I mean, and then to hear that uh, the root of that word, I mean, words mean things. They have an etymology to them. And so, okay, may- maybe we should really quickly clarify um, some of the misconceptions when we talk about the gospel. Um, I had a conversation a while back the other day, and this person was talking about the gospel and I and I didn't dare challenge them at the point. I'm going to have further conversations down the road. But when they were using the word gospel, they were using it interchangeably with the Ten Commandments. Ooh. And, and, okay. And so, so yeah, yeah Neudorf, okay, unpack that. What, what, what was the confusion? Uh, the gospel, and then she was talking about the uh, obedience to God's command, and it was definitely very much intertwined, the gospel, with, with the law. Yeah, so as with so many terms... There can be a broad sense, a wide sense, and a narrow sense. And what I just articulated is the gospel in the narrow sense. Narrow sense, yeah. The gospel, properly speaking, in its uh, uh, strictest definition as the good news concerning Jesus Christ. But the gospel, the word gospel can also be used in a wide sense for uh, the whole life of Jesus, the entire life and ministry of Jesus, which is why we have four Gospels. Um, The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, don't just contain the Gospel in the narrow sense. There's a great deal of law in the Gospels. Um, And so by extension, the Gospel can be the entirety of Christian doctrine, which includes the law. So the Gospel in the narrow sense, the good news of Jesus Christ, is distinct from the law, because the law tells us what God expects of us, what God commands us to do. The law demands good works of us, but the gospel tells us what God has promised us, what God has done on our behalf, what God does for us. Uh, So as such, they don't overlap. The law and the gospel are kept in their own spheres. But sometimes the gospel as a word is used in the broad sense to encompass both the gospel and the law, uh, that can lead to some confusion. It's a necessary way of speaking. The Bible uses the gospel in the broad sense sometimes, but we need to be precise in our language and make sure that we never confuse gospel in the narrow sense with the law. Yeah, good stuff. You know, I've, 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 I've often said this before, too, with confirmation students, when it comes to the long gospel uh, in the narrow sense, unlike how you, how you articulate that, Neuendorf, uh, the law in its in in, in its uh, narrow sense, if you will, uh, is typically an imperative. It tells us and calls us to do something. So, uh, thou shall not kill. In other words, thou shall uphold life. It's given an imperative, a demand. Whereas the gospel typically is going to be giving what we call in the Greek the indicative. It's something that's complete, something that's done. Christ died for you. Uh, he has risen for you for your justification. It's something that's done. And so that in the Greek language, we call that the indicative. It's kind of the mood of certainty. It's the accomplished accomplished kind of sense, whereas the imperative is to do something. So law is do, gospel is done. Is that oversimplifying things? What do you think, Bradmeyer? I mean, if you're going to explain it to kids, I don't know how else you would do it. <laughs> yeah. Right? I, and, and and this does get complicated because like Neuendorf said, um, w- all of God's word is good. Right, every bit of it, and all of it is good news, even the parts that we don't like and even the parts that condemn us. Um, but when we talk about e- evangelism, we are talking about gospel in the narrow sense as kind of our first, f- first foot forward. Not to say that, you know, when talking with people and bringing uh, the message of Christ to people, the law doesn't show up. But, uh, you know, the power of salvation is in this proclamation of Jesus and who he is. And this is what the Holy Spirit uses to impart faith, is the word of God, which is focused on Christ and his death and resurrection. You know, if you're engaged in an evangelistic uh, presentation, so you meet someone who knows nothing about Jesus, uh, who knows nothing about the Bible, uh, in that initial evangelistic presentation, you're probably going to involve the law because the gospel in the narrow sense uh, is not intelligible to one who does not have the law. Uh, the second use of the law that reveals our sin and condemns us for falling short of the glory of God uh, is what sets the stage for Jesus uh, paying for the sin that the law has revealed and giving us his righteousness to fulfill that law. Um, So 
I would say that uh, when we talk about evangelism, the law is an element in that, and thus uh, an evangelistic presentation is the gospel in the broad sense. It will involve the law, but that which uh, converts, which is the whole point of evangelism, that which actually converts is the gospel in the narrow sense alone. You know, Bo and I were talking the other day, and um, I think it was Bo and I were talking. We're just busy on the phone trying to keep all our conversations uh, straight here. But there was an old illustration used by this old evangelist, and he said, imagine being on a plane. And uh, uh, so imagine if Bo and I are on the plane together, and uh, the the, uh, uh, person, uh, what do they call stewardess, or the uh, flight attendant comes up and says, hey, I have a parachute for you and Bo. For, for both of you guys, it'll enhance your flight. And we're like, all right, bring it on, and enhance your flight. And we put these big parachutes on, and then it's what digging into our back, and we're sitting forward. And so then we're leaning into our tray in front of us, and the person puts their seat down, and we have no room. And then partway through, I look at Bo, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is not enhancing our flight. We get up, and we both spike our spike our uh, parachutes on the ground, and we say, enough with that. This is, this is garbage. You know, this did not enhance our flight. Now, obviously, uh, that's you know, portraying the parachute in good news is supposed to enhance your flight, but it doesn't have the proper context of, of the reality. Now imagine same scenario, the flight attendant comes up and says, Hey, uh, our left engine just went out. We're leaking fuel. We're most likely going to crash. Here's a parachute to save you from certain peril. Now, all of a sudden we put the parachutes on, it's digging into our back. We don't care. Uh, we're bumping our head in the seat on the front. We don't care. Uh, the tray is digging into our belly. Um, and we don't care because what we have, we have hope. We have we have a gift that's going to help help us from the certain peril. So they're they're in it without the understanding of the law per se of our condition of reality. The gospel makes no sense. Did I say that right, Bo? I mean, did that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. No, that's that we that was you and I that had spoke about that. I guess um, the thing that I wanted to bring up is that that uh, uh, the law the 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 gospel in the wide sense part of that can be understood by natural revelation the fact that we can look around the world and tell that there is a god and that that there was a god who there is a creator we might not know who that god is and then we have the law written on our hearts um that that there is an objective morality that is bigger and outside of us but we don't necessarily know where that that law and who that creator is. But then we have in the gospel, a revealed revelation of what, who that God is and what he has done for us. So, so in explaining the gospel in the wide sense of the terms, the law is written on people's hearts, but they have to understand that that is true and right. And that we will die from that law. And then in in what is revealed in the gospel that 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 creator so loved us that he did something about it i i think a good analogy for understanding you know this stuff is is the analogy of a physician right so the uh jesus being the good physician so in order to prescribe the remedy you must first make the diagnosis otherwise it doesn't make sense to take the medicine so you know, if talking to people, um, I mean, think of your average, you know, spiritual but not religious pagan type person. They don't really understand what the problem is. I mean, they recognize there's deficiencies in the world, but they don't have a, a, a an intellectual apparatus to make sense of it. So you have to put the problem into proper context and say, this is what's going on here, and this is the solution to it. Why is there death in the world? Well, because of sin. What's sin? It's because we transgress the things that God has laid out for us to do. We try to violate the laws that he has put into this world, laws of nature, laws of morality, so on and so forth. And that brings all kinds of harm to us. And there is actually a remedy, but it's not found in us doing this stuff perfectly. That remedy is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so you kind of have to um, you know, set the stage because you know, it's just like if you go to your oncologist and the oncologist says, okay, we're going to start chemo. Well, why? I have cancer? Do I have cancer? What's going on here? No, you just need the chemo. Okay, but why? It'll enhance, it'll enhance your life. <laughs> it'll enhance yeah. your life. It'll make you better. It'll but your life. but it's, it's going to make my hair fall out. Why do I need this? Oh, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. You just it'll need enhance, this. It'll enhance your life. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Get some radiation so, treatments. <laughs> so this probably brings us to this idea of uh, maybe what we hear a lot is the word mission. 
Okay. Um, so the other day, I just I just went into the English Standard Version and I typed in the word uh, a search for mission. And I was actually surprised. Uh, the word mission only occurred like four or five times in the whole Bible, uh, in the in the English, you know, English ESV. And uh, it seemed like it was two or three of those times. It was basically a mission of, of certain individuals called to go and destroy another nation. And so this idea of mission uh, relatively uh, did not appear uh, a whole lot in the Bible. But nonetheless, we do use that term. So maybe why don't we unpack that? You know, what what is mission? How do we use it? biblically uh, how is it used incorrectly and then that potentially will lead us into talking about evangelism a little bit more well uh, mission is a latin word missio and it just means sending um, and it's true you're not going to find much in english translations of the bible that have what we think of as mission described as mission with that term uh, however kind of like with the word trinity um, you're not going to find the word Trinity in the Bible, and yet the the idea behind the Trinity is all over the Bible. Um, you're not going to find the word mission so much in the Bible, but the idea behind mission, rightly understood, is all over, certainly in the New Testament. Um, sometimes they'll have like Jonah sent. Okay, Jonah's on a mission to Nineveh. Um, he's a missionary. Uh, but, of course, the, the great missionary of the New Testament is St. Paul. Um, St. Paul, we, we talk about his missionary journeys. And the, the term missionary isn't used in the New Testament. Uh, Paul doesn't say, I'm, uh, I'm engaged in missions. However, uh, he was um, called, an or- well, he was called directly by Jesus, uh, but then he was uh, ordained in Antioch, and they consecrated him and Barnabas for a mission that the Holy Spirit had prepared for them. And Paul and Barnabas go to um, Cyprus and then to Galatia and come back. And then there's another mission and they go uh, back through Galatia and they go to uh, Macedonia and Greece. And ultimately Paul ends up on a mission even to um, Rome, even to Italy, and perhaps even to Spain. Um, depending on how you understand uh, some of his writings. So uh, Paul is the missionary par excellence, uh, but really all of the apostles are missionaries in a sense because the word apostolos means one who is uh, sent out with authority, like an ambassador. Um, so the, the word mission may not be there very much, but the idea of mission is being sent out by God to evangelize a new area. That's definitely biblical. Okay, so so sent out, right? So that idea sent, great stuff, Newendorf. So sent, but I, I think we should end, complete that sent for what and to do what. I mean, that's that's going to be the big, maybe that's going to be the big crux where we compare what was happening with the Old Testament and with Paul and so forth, like Jonah and Paul and so forth that you mentioned, sent out to do what. And so when missionaries go, they're sent to do what and accomplish what. With the idea, with the idea of apostle, what the etymology of apostle? When when an apostle of Jesus Christ, that's more than just somebody walking around telling the, that he's sent with the authority of Christ. Yeah. In in I explain that aspect because I can't articulate it. But also the the apostles, even during Jesus' earthly ministry, were sent two by two to all the towns of Israel um, to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, or the kingdom of heaven is upon us. Um, so they're telling about Jesus, that Jesus, is the, he, he's come. Um, so Jesus sends them to, to bring peace. And if the town rejects the gospel, rejects the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God, their peace will return to them. And it will be worse on the day of judgment for that town than for Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, so that's the authority that Jesus gives to his apostles. Um, he also, in Luke, there's also a wider group, these 70 or 72 disciples who are also sent two by two with the authority of Jesus. But uh, the, it's not like somebody woke up one morning and said, you know, I think I'm going to go uh, tell everyone in Bethsaida about Jesus. No, this is Jesus commanding them. You go to these towns, you go two by two. This, these are the terms on which you're going to be uh, going on this journey, this mission, um, and let, come back and tell me how it goes. Um, and then after Jesus' resurrection, he tells his disciples at the conclusion of Luke's gospel, 
you're going to be my witnesses in uh, Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So that's another uh, concept related to missions is witness, that the, the apostles are witnesses. And they're not witnesses in a general sense. They're official witnesses. It, right, right. Be, being an apostle, being one of the 12, means you actually knew Jesus during his earthly ministry. You were there from the baptism of John. Uh, you witnessed his resurrection. So you're going to be an officially appointed witness of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, so uh, oh, I've, now we'll get to the Great Commission later in the, in the podcast, but uh, that's related to this idea. The apostles are sent out with authority from Jesus to, uh, to bring the, the glad tidings of great joy concerning Jesus. Good stuff. Good stuff. So, so would we properly say that when we are sent on mission, it's with the good news? I mean, to proclaim the good news. I mean, like when Paul went, or we, we hear about this when Paul, he <clears throat> came into the different cities, he went to the synagogues, and he proclaimed Christ from the scriptures. Now, we should add that, you know, when Paul's doing this, when it says scriptures, namely, it's going to be the Old Testament scriptures. And so he comes in, he's, you know, reading from the Old Testament scriptures, proclaiming Christ. And so, his intent and purpose, as well as the disciples, is to convey a message, uh, to convey the word of God. Yeah, I, I don't want to hog this, and and, and no, anyone can, can you know zip me out here anytime you want. But um, I will say that um, th while the the mission of the apostles was based on the Old Testament, um, it was the Old Testament as understood with their official testimony with what they had seen and heard. So they could bear witness to what they had seen and heard and say, we know how all of this is fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ. Uh, we are not witnesses in that sense. We were not with him from the baptism of John. We did not witness his death. We didn't witness his resurrection, but we do have the witness of the apostles in the form of the New Testament. And so for them, they were the New Testament because they were, they were bearing witness themselves. But now we still have their witness in the New Testament. So when we are sent on a mission in the New Testament sense to bring the gospel to communities that have not heard it, um, we are going with the Old Testament, yes, but with the New Testament predominating as the testimony of the apostles. Building on the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets. Yeah. Yeah. I think this brings up a question that, that needs to be addressed. Who exactly is given the mission? You know, there's there's this idea out there, everyone a missionary or whatever, that we all individually bear this mandate. And I can't help but notice that whenever Christ gives mandates about New Testament things like, say, the Great Commission, um, he's talking not to individuals, but to an assembled group of Christians, in this case, particularly the apostles. And uh, traditionally, that's been read as the church. The church is given the mission to go out and make disciples and to baptize and so on and so forth. And the church sends men trained as pastors to rightly handle God's word, missionaries, to do this thing. That's how the mission is carried out. The whole church is involved in that by supporting the pastor. And it doesn't exclude the idea that individually, individual Christians can you know, talk about Jesus with their friends and neighbors. That's fine. But I find that there's a great um, harm that comes when we tell people that you're all sort of individually supposed to be missionaries. And if you like mess up or forget to tell somebody about Jesus, that you've like deprived them of the kingdom of God and now they're going to go to hell and it's all your fault. I don't think that's healthy. And I don't think that's a biblical view of what mission is. You know, some people are called to do other things with their lives, serve their neighbors by being, you know, farmers and sheepy, sheepy farmers and whatnot. And uh, then there's some people who are called to handle God's word. And of course, all Christians handle God's word as Christians. But that's not to say that every one of us needs to like get, drop everything and move to the darkest heart of Africa in order to preach the gospel. Yeah. You know, um, in fact, if we were to just do that on our own, that would be against the good order of the church. Well, I mean, that's you know, to build on that. I remember when I was a kid, you know, I had, you know, a heart for being in the church. I remember that very clearly, but I was terrified of getting involved in the church because I didn't want to go to Africa. And why? Because it was, it's too hot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do well with heat, you know? And so I'm like, this just terrified that I'd end up in Africa and be sweating <laughs> and just be terrible. <laughs> but uh, more serious note, but, you know, we think about, uh, well, the, the, the apostles too, this idea where they follow Jesus. 
there's always this this misconception, at least I was given as a kid, was that I have to be willing to what forsake everything, sell everything I have, and then go to Africa. That was kind of what was portrayed to me, that you need to give up all your worldly possessions and go to Africa. And that is then what, that is the pinnacle of being a servant of Jesus. And But if you look at the apostles, uh, when they came to the, the Sea of Galilee, they were hopping in boats. I mean, did they just come and find random boats? No, they were their boats. And so they didn't necessarily you know, sell all the fishing equipment. In fact, after Jesus was crucified, what do they do? I come to see the apostles like, well, let's go fishing. <laughs> so, and they used their boats and they had their their uh, equity and their their resources that they used. Uh, so it wasn't this whole abandonment. And so the materials that we have, the, the resources that we have, uh, again, we're to be good stewards of those. And those good stewards of those resources we have are for, uh, for serving within the church and serving our neighbor, uh, per se. Uh, but yeah, Brad Murray, you bring up a great point on that as far as missions per se. Well, this is there's two ditches I've seen in this in my my time as a pastor. Ditch A is this idea that every individual Christian must embody the fullness of this mission, right? And you bear all that responsibility on your individual shoulders. That's that's one extreme error. The other one is that you have no responsibility in this whatsoever, and that you can just like not do anything. Like when the opportunity arises to invite someone to church, you don't do it and you don't have to do it. And you know, who cares that that seems to be again, too far to the other extreme. And uh, it seems that, you know, the, the, well, I don't want to jump the gun on this, but we're supposed to do what we can as Christians to serve our neighbors. And the greatest thing we can serve our neighbors with, of course, is the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I don't think that we should sell short our, our layman um, doing that. But on the other hand, we don't want to burden our layman and make them feel like that if they chose to be a sheepy farmer or a sewer sucker or whatever else they decided to do, um, that they're somehow deficient because they didn't sell everything and move to Africa. So how can you tell if a church is fulfilling Matthew 28 or not? Are they baptizing people and teaching them the full counsel of the word of God? That That's my question. I mean, so... So if a church isn't sending missionaries to Africa, but is instead faithfully preaching Christ crucified every Sunday, they are evangelizing. They are, they are telling people the good news. They are, they are spreading the gospel. Um, not, so not to say that, that people can't be invited. but In what sense are we using the word church? Do we mean a local congregation? A local congregation, I apologize. Oh. Now, a, a local congregation most likely is not going to be on its own local individual level uh, furnishing and sending missionaries to Africa. However, uh, one of the main purposes for the forming of the uh, Missouri Synod was so that our congregations could band together and by pooling our resources, send missionaries to foreign lands where the gospel uh, has not been heard or uh, it, it, there are still communities where uh, the gospel is not penetrated or is uh, is so corrupted that there's still a need of the pure gospel there. Um, so the Missouri Synod, early in its existence, sent missionaries to India, sent missionaries to Africa, sent missionaries to black communities in the American South. Um, so if it, if we have that system established, then I see it working similarly to the general call to the pastoral office. Um, you have an inward call and the outward call. The inward call is the man himself has the conviction, I, I think I need to be a pastor. Uh, and that's what gets you going to seminary. Yeah, uh, that's what your, Paul says, that's, if a man desires, I desires a good thing. You know? Yep. Yep. So, yep. Uh, that the thing is, that man doesn't know for sure. Is this desire in my heart wrought by God because He's calling me to be a pastor? You can't. You might be manufacturing ideas in your own head. So you go to seminary, you do the work, uh, you prove yourself apt to teach, and so on. And then uh, a congregation will issue you an external divine call. And now you know, okay, I'm definitely called by God. This is where God wants me. So you have the inward call and the external call. And I think something similar happens with foreign missions. Uh, there are men who have the temperament to leave everything familiar behind and go to the African bush and lead lives of exotic poverty and have these adventures and misadventures and 
and offend the Office of National Mi International Mission of the Missouri Synod uh, by being too faithful. And, um, <laughs> the, and um, then, you know, the, these guys have this inner call. They are passionate about it. They want to do it. They're ready to do everything necessary to make it work. And then after their training, the church at large says, yes, we want you to be our missionary to this region in Africa. And they send them. Now they have the inner call and the external call. Most of us don't have either. And that's okay. You don't have to torture your conscience because you don't feel the call to leave everything and go to Africa. There are men that God will raise up, has raised up, is raising up to do that. Well, that's, I think, I think that's, well, that's, that's important. It's not bad to send people to Africa. It's not bad to not want to be a pastor. You know, God has a place for you in his kingdom, even if you're not a pastor or a pastor missionary. Um, on the other hand, I, I think that we also need to remember that mission isn't just Africa. Yep. Right. It's not just to people who aren't white. It's, it's also yep. to the pagans that live next door to me, you know, and uh, even in our rural towns in North Dakota, there's a lot of people who have no functional attachment to the church or, and have no knowledge of the gospel. And we need to remember that those people need Jesus just as much as we need Jesus, just as much as the guys in Africa need Jesus. And so it shouldn't be either we send missionaries to Africa or we do something in our local neighborhoods to tell people about Jesus. Maybe it should just be that we tell people about Jesus wherever it is able for us to be doing so. You know, one, one thing is interesting, just from reading I've done, I've done in the past on the subject, uh, it was really surprising to find out that Matthew 28, the Great Commission, I'm not trying to diminish Matthew 28, so I'm not trying to toss it out the window or rip it all the Bible by any means. Uh, just, it's just a point of fact, it's pretty interesting to see that Matthew 28 was not a predominant text in the early church as far as talking about, you know, evangelism. Um, now, I think, I think if we look across the American landscape, uh, you look at all the mission and vision statements that are developed by churches and so forth, which is really a lot of it's a business principle brought into the church. That's a whole different subject. But you'll see a, a mission and vision statement. If it doesn't have Matthew 28 listed, it would be insufficient according to today's standards. Whereas the early church, uh, the the main um, focus of, of, of evangelism was typically tied to the banquet, uh, that there's a, a heavenly banquet and the food is ready. Uh, and there was a text from this last Sunday uh, uh, Trinity too. Uh, the, the banquet's ready. The food is prepared. Go out and invite. And uh, they're not coming. Some people are distracted and they, you know, I got, I got to go tend to my field. I got to go tend to my spouse and all these other things. I have excuses. Well, then go out to the uh, hedges and the, the outskirts of the community and invite. And it's this idea of inviting people to the banquet. Now, if you think of that evangelism from that way, it really works in beautiful. I mean, that, 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 that it's accomplished in Christ, that the mission is accomplished in Christ, that, that coming, living, dying, uh, rising for us, it's an accomplished fact, indicative of which what Neuendorf hit at the very beginning. It's, it's, it's the good news of what has been done for you, full stop. So the meal has been prepared. Uh, everything's ready. And then it's just what? Come and see. It's like what uh, Nathaniel says, right? Come and see the Christ. We have found the Christ. Come and see. Come and eat. Come and partake. Uh, that's a, I think it's a real simple, beautiful way of understanding uh, one aspect of, of, of evangelizing is come and see, come and receive. Well, uh, this is, sorry, go ahead. Bill. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, build oh. on that. I, I was going to say, I think this is something that often gets missed in the cultural discussions. We turn evangelism into either a set of propositions to argue somebody into. So, you know, it, I hear this from some of my members. Well, pastor, but first I have to convince them that, you know, the word of God is infallible without error. And, and before I, you know, can tell them about Jesus, I have to do that. Or I have to convince them about law and gospel right off the bat. Okay, we don't reason people into the faith. We should give right. a good defense of what we believe. But the thing that converts people is the proclamation. And the other thing, too, is we get apologetic about it. You know, we kind of, we are, we approach the gospel as if it's something we're almost ashamed of. You know, and so we have to like dress it up with pancake feeds and, uh, you know, social service projects in order to sell it to people. And maybe we should just let the word be the word and do what the word says and not have to dress it up like we want to hide it or downplay it or, you know, give people a bait and switch or something like that. I'll be there. Cut out there for a second. <clears throat> Hope what is wrong there? with your internet? Yeah. This is... <laughs> Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Are, are, we, are we there? Yeah, yep. we're 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 all here, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you were saying saying dressing up. So I, what I heard was we're supposed to dress up the gospel with pancake feeds. Yeah, don't do that. 
Don't do that. Okay. Okay. Don't, <laughs> don't do, do that. that. Don't do that. Don't do that. So, okay. So, so, so I, I was just going to ask, what about, I mean, with that, there, I mean, we are commanded also to dust off our feet at times. So what is, how does that, how does that play out locally? I mean, in the local environment, what is dusting off, like proclaiming and walking away? Because like you say, you can turn it into uh, an apologetic competition or trying to reason someone who's hard hearted. Uh, and you can lose credibility sitting there and having an argument with someone when somebody standing next to him just needs to hear the proclamation of the gospel. And that's it. You know, I've, I've, I've been interested in addressing that because there is a, there is a, a collection of wicked guys trying to influence the Missouri Synod who, uh, among other things they've done, they've uh, resurrected the idea of uh, brushing the dust off your feet, which is worth talking about. Uh, but what they say is, hey, we've already tried to evangelize Africa. We've already tried to evangelize uh, blacks in the American South. They won't have it. So let's uh, brush the dust off our feet and just focus on our white neighbors. Um, well, if, if we're going to apply that principle, why are our white neighbors not church-going believers in Jesus Christ? It's because either they or some recent ancestor apostatized. Uh, they, their families were pretty much all Christian at one time. Uh, somewhere along the line, the faith was lost. Um, so does that mean we should be saying, well, all right, it's their ancestors' fault. We'll, we'll wipe the dust off our feet against them and not evangelize them. No, I, I, I think maybe if you're dealing with an individual person or an individual community and you are encountering steadfast refusal to hear and believe the gospel— yeah, you're at some point you're wasting your time and have to conclude that God has hardened these people and I'm going to go elsewhere. But I don't think we can make the determination this continent uh, or this race is hardened by God and we have to uh, kick the dust off our feet against them. Well, I think well, we, I mean, can, we can see it on the individual level, though. I mean, yeah. and some people, if their ears are open, they'll hear. But if your ears are closed to it and you just have resent or uh, just argument and resentment without any listening, then then dust, then it's not your message. Don't take it personally. Yeah. Talk of Christ and and walk away. Well, I think there's also an aspect to this, too. I mean, that that we, we talked about the Great Commission, right, being uh, sent, right? Neuendorf was talking about being sent with the gospel to proclaim the gospel. I think we should differentiate that from the great commandment. So you have great commission, great command. Great commandment is loving your neighbor, uh, mercy work. And so, so I, I, I've said we have to be very careful, and, and I don't want to be misunderstood, that I distinguish between the great commandment and great commission. Great commission is confessing Christ, proclaiming the gospel, missions sent for the uh, gospel itself. The great commandment is sent for mercy work. Um, and and compassion and and loving your neighbor, both are are good. And oftentimes, when you do great commandment work, it leads to an opportunity to do great commission work per se. Um, but we have to make sure that we differentiate between the two. So if I go and I rake some leaves for a neighbor, um, all I've done there is what, and I don't want to diminish that, but all I've done is what I've done mercy work. I've loved my neighbor, but I have so, not proclaimed the gospel by what doing a good work. Uh, the, well, there's, there's that awful fa that awful quote yeah. that's. Francis. Falsely attributed to Francis, right? You know, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Well, if you're not mm. using words, you're not actually preaching the gospel. Right, right, mm. right. And so we should differentiate between that, and that's probably one of the biggest downfalls I see in American Christianity is that when it comes to missions, we think uh, missions or evangel evangelism, that if we go and do a good work, we go make a well, right? Or we go dig a well, or we go and rake some leaves of the neighbor. Therefore, we have what? Oh, we've done mission work per se. Yeah. Okay, I think there's a very similar dynamic going on with the word mission and the word ministry. Okay, explain so that. With ministry, um, there's the office of the pastoral ministry that Jesus instituted for the exercise of the, the keys among the congregation. That's the ministry. But then sometimes laity can feel like, oh, well, we're not in the ministry, so we don't matter. So then you say, oh, well, we're all ministers, just not in the right. ministry. And so right. we... We call this or that activity within our church is a ministry. It's all ministry. Now, okay, there's a sense in which the word ministry could be properly used that way, but that's not why we're using it. We use the word ministry 
to try and take some of the glory from the pastoral ministry and apply it to these other non-pastoral things that we're doing. And I see something similar going on with the word mission. Yeah. Properly speaking, the, the word mission refers to evangelism in communities where the gospel has not yet been preached. Um, so that's mission properly speaking. But then you can be sent. That's a mission. You can be sent to dig a well. You can be sent to build a building. You can be sent to, to um, operate a school or whatever it might be. And those are really good things. And we maybe we should be doing those things. But we call them mission in order to draw off some of the glory and feeling good about ourselves from the evangel evangelistic mission, which is focused on proclaiming the gospel. I yeah. think we have to also keep, um, like we spoke of last time, was the ordering of things and, and things in the proper order. We don't do the ministry or the missions because... Um, it's, to prove we're Christians. We don't go out and get conversions so that we can validate how well our church is doing. We go and do these things. We do, we do mission work. We f fulfill the great commandment and the great commission because we are Christians. Um, because, well, both, we, both because we've been commanded by it, but also when our new man looks upon that commandment, he says, yes, this is good. I want to do this thing. Um, so he delights in the commandment to serve his neighbor and also to share the good news. Well, that comes back to the whole idea of the banquet. When when the food is ready, you get the best prime rib, the best wine, uh, the best, I mean, just uh, absolutely phenomenal food. Um, you know, it, re it reminds me of uh, uh, when I was my ordination anniversary in a church down when I was down in Southern California, my one year anniversary for ordination, a, a parishioner who he was basically a professional cook. He, he, he wasn't a cook at the time, but he had professional training. He had us over for a meal. He had prime rib and uh, what is that that French thing where you use a blowtorch on the top of it? Uh, creme, creme brulee. brulee. Yeah, you used a blowtorch on it. And and it was by far one of the best meals I've ever had in my entire oh, life. Yeah. I thought you were talking about the dessert. No, it's flambe. You burn it, you know. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I that showed my ignorance on it. But I, just, I just know it tasted awesome. And, and if he were to say, you know, hey, pastor, I'm going to have that same meal. You want to come? I'm like, I'm there. And if he were to say, I have... I have 15 open seats. Um, now, first of all, I'd probably be pretty selective in who I invite for those 15 seats. But let's just say he's, I have, it's, it's completely open. Why wouldn't I invite people to come to have that? I would invite everyone. I'm like, this is the best meal I've ever had in my entire life. You need to come and what? Receive. And that's really a beautiful picture of the gospel. So I, I think part of, part of our issue, I think in America, and be very critical of our American culture, is I think, I think many times we don't really understand just how beautiful the gospel is because oftentimes we don't understand the, the predicament of sin that we're in. But when that fullness of the gospel comes in the midst of our broken, uh, sinful condition, and we understand just how much uh, Christ has done for us, there's a compelling, a gospel compelling where you just go and you share. Uh, the banquet's ready. Come and eat. Why would you come? Okay. If, if, what What are the two main communities, main organizations in the United States that we associate with active missionary work? The Gideons. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> door to door missionary work. Oh, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. Mormons. Mormons yeah. yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, and they're very effective, and they do it all the time. Um, we had some at our house on Saturday morning. Uh, two ladies came to our door, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. So um, why are they doing it? Law. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I, 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 yeah, if, it's, it's, it's to, to a, it's, 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 I don't do good works to become a Christian. I do good works because I already am a Christian. They're doing these oftentimes, and I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but they're doing these things to achieve some sort of status of yes. assurance. They, they they have to earn something before God by going on these two by yep. two mission uh, excursions to door by door to their neighbors, uh, yep. and uh, that is of course completely inverting the way it's supposed to operate for Christians. If we if, we go uh, because we love God and and are empowered by His gospel and want to share it. If if your pastor tells you that you need to evangelize to the point where your conscience is burdened by the gospel then then he is not conveying to you properly what evangelism is or should be. And I think there are many Christians in many churches who feel burdened by the idea of sharing the gospel. 
No, it, it is. We were talking about this yesterday. Um, uh, there's nothing wrong with having a prepared set of statements or something like that. Like this is how you talk about, this is a good way in, in which to, to convey the gospel. People are, I almost got to think of it in two senses. There's the church's mission to, to evangelize and spread the gospel. And then there's the individual and the individual, there's nothing wrong with being prepared. In fact, we're commanded to be yeah. ready in season and out to share, to share Christ, to share the joy that is in you. Yeah. Um, and that being prepared requires preparation. So thinking about it is thinking about it and being prepared is not against the law, but we maybe don't do a great job of Luth as Lutherans as do we do a good job as Lutherans in preparing people to go spread or share that joy? I think, I think one of the distinctions that needs to be made and, and I've used this many times is that again, what we're talking about at the very beginning is that when it comes to evangelizing, uh, we're not a used car salesman. Um, we're a herald of good news, a news announcer. And so I, 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 I confess I've done this many times wrong where I feel like I'm a used car salesman, salesman where I come and I, you know, give the gospel and I kind of what, tell them to take it for a drive. And then I add something to it. Like, you know, tell you what, if, if you get this, I'll throw in a free blender for you as well. And then, and then you kind of try to spice up the deal. And then at the very end, you, you okay, now we sign on the dotted line. If they sign on the dotted line, then hooray, then I've made a sale. Right. And, and, um, I've done that so often, uh, to my own detriment and to the embarrassment of the church. Whereas if we see evangelism as a news announcer, a, a herald where you come and you just proclaim good news, uh, and you share that good news, you just proclaim it. You're just announcing what is, what's an indicative, what has actually been accomplished. Um, I bring this story up probably too much, but there was a guy named Ezra King uh, down in Southern California. I got to know he's a Presbyterian pastor from the Sheep Pen Church. And uh, Dr. King, uh, he always called me college pastor because I had a college, I had a backpack and he was a college, he was college pastor. He always called me college pastor with his raspy voice. And he told me, uh, we're out to eat a, Denny's once. And he said, you know, when he was ordained, he promised three things. Number one, that he would read a book of the Bible each day. And number two, he'd pray. And then number three, he would tell people about Jesus. And I remember in his, you know, a little bit of broken English, you know, he would say, he said to me, he goes, he's a college pastor. You know how I tell people about Jesus? And I said, well, no, Ezra. And it was always, always so much fun to hear him talk and how he shared. It's just so awesome. And he said, I go up to a person and I say, do you know Jesus? And this is just exactly what I said. Do you know Jesus? And they say, no. And then I say, sit down, I tell you. <laughs> and he smiled at me. And that, that's and I saw it numerous times. He just sit down. Let me tell you about Jesus. And he told about the forgiveness of sins in Christ. Uh, but why? It's true. It's indicative. It's what happened. He's just announcing it. Whoever would listen. Some pieces, some people listen, some wouldn't. And he keeps on but, confessing. But to, tell the, but to tell the average parishioner that that's what they need to do is just... That can be condemning to the conscience. Is that that is that is that is what the standard is of what Christian evangelism should look like. It can be to where hearing that burdens an individual. Um, well, okay, because so, not all are called to that. So, case in point, and I've said this before, that if you have an opportunity and you're comfortable doing that, go for it. However, if you're not comfortable, if that's not your disposition, um, I think of my my uh, old parishioner Donna Olson. Donna was awesome. She would actually in my the small town of Gwinner where I was at, she would watch the uh, the signs where the houses came up for sale, and as soon as the house would sell, the family would move in. She'd bring over some coffee cake, and she's like, "Hi, I'm Donna. Welcome to the community." You know, and she goes, "Do you have a church home?" They say, "No." She goes, "Okay, I'll save you a spot on Sunday." And she'd have, "Here, I'll see you Sunday." <laughs> it, was, it was great. <laughs> it was just just great. And and the thing is, it was so genuine with her. It was just it's absolutely hundred percent genuine with her. Uh, that it wasn't it wasn't a work. It was just, you know, we have a great church. We have a great gospel. Um, you can sit next to me. You know, it was, it was wonderful. Thoughts? <laughs> I think there is something to uh, different temperaments. Yeah. Um, some folks really are cut out for the uh, cold call, you might say, uh, for going to a complete stranger and saying, let me tell you about Jesus. Um, and God uses such personalities mightily. Uh, there are other people who just don't have the temperament for that. Um, yeah. But whatever situation you're in, you can find the circumstances to uh, encounter a friend, a family member, 
uh, a neighbor, a coworker, uh, whoever it might be, who does not know Jesus. And uh, especially if you ask God to give you the opportunity, the open door, um, you'll have the opportunity. And then, then the trick is to be prepared for the opportunity. And the way to do that is just to be always learning, to be always deep in the study of God's word. And the better you know God's word, the better you know the ins and outs of Christian doctrine, the, the more easy and natural it'll be to share that doctrine, particularly the specifically the saving truth of Jesus Christ with your neighbors. Sometimes I don't think we give the, uh, we give, sometimes I think that we uh, lower or, or reduce what the power of the word is. The word is always at work and it is continually either hardening hearts or softening them, one or the other. It can't do nothing. Um, so when it, uh, when it goes out, when you speak about Christ, that person is hardened or softened. And it might take, you, you, don't, you can't or don't always expect immediate results. It might take years. It might be the seed that was planted that, that God will water and, will, um, and it, might take, it might take time before that growth happens too. So how, how do we kind of start wrapping this up? I mean, so we've talked about what the gospel is, what missions is, um, you know, what evangelism is, what it's not. Uh, so the why evangelism, we've kind of been hitting it all already. Um, but how would, how would we summarize everything we've talked about to put that nice bow on the end uh, that we want to put <laughs> at the end of our, our all show? Right, all right, I'll, I'll take a crack at this. Okay, let's do it. Let's hear it. People need Jesus. Okay. Because they're sinners. Okay. And sin is bad. Okay. And people should be told about Jesus from the word of God because the word of God is powerful and does things like convert them. Okay. <laughs> also, it's not a burden. It's a joy, right? It's a joy to, uh, to, to share with Jesus. It's a joy that could get you killed. That's right. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful joy. <laughs> we should stop it right there. <laughs> Ta-da! Yeah. Well, um, I think I think Pastor Noondorf said it best a while back it, that <laughs> that we go into it. This is this is the medicine that you need. We have we have life. We have life to share with people, and they have nothing but death to offer. Um, this is th- it's good news. It is eternal salvation, and apart from it, you don't have it. Well, if you are a Christian, you have in your possession the treasure that gives eternal life. And Mm -hmm. if you love someone, you want them to have that eternal life. So uh, to me, that's that's the great motivator. Not that God's going to zap me for not doing it enough, um, but that I have something that my loved one really needs. I think it's... Okay. Oh, I, I think of probably opening up another can of worm, but we could talk about love and what is love too, because the world would tell us that to loving is to love is to be tolerant and accepting and not to talk about Jesus, keep him out of the conversation. But true love, and don't judge me, don't look at me. But the gospel, on the, the in the wide sense, includes telling people of their shortcoming and of the solution. So I think it was Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller, who's a militant atheist who loves to debunk the Bible and so on, uh, once said in an interview that after a show, uh, a a Christian approached him with a Bible and said, here, this will give you eternal life. And um, of course, Penn doesn't believe a, a word of it, but he was profoundly moved by the experience of being evangelized by a member of his audience. Um, and he told the interviewer, how much would you have to hate someone not to tell them about Jesus if you really believe he's going to go to hell without Jesus? Yeah, it's not wrong. No, mm-hmm. no, yeah. no. So we evangelize um, because this is a good gift. It's good news. Uh, it's wonderful news. Uh, and, and I think, Neundorf, you said it, man, I, I just, I, I've been struck by our last episode. You had this little segment. I don't even know if you were realize how powerful it was. You basically said something to the fact, which you just kind of repeated again here, that we actually have uh, immortal life. We have the forgiveness of sins. We actually have that in our possession as Christians that has been given unto us and that we've been baptized. We receive this. And so there's a, a confidence that goes with this. There's a confidence and assurance that that uh, we have something great 
and we don't keep it for ourselves. We, we, we share it. Um, and, and, and that's, that's the blessedness of this church that we're not some Gnostic, uh, sectarian group where we, what, uh, protect the gift that we have to what, protect it from the outside influences, but that gift, what goes out, it's like that seed, right? That seed that's cast out in all the fields. I, I'm, I'm sharing Jesus with you, not because I am desperate to recruit other members to save my organization. I'm sharing Jesus with you because he's wonderful. And yeah. the life in him is the greatest gift in the universe. And I want you to, to have it. Amen. 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 So evangelism, man, man, let me try again. Evangelism is telling the good news of Christ, his birth, life, death, and resurrection to an unbelieving world so that ears may hear the good news that sins are forgiven, death has been overcome, and the devil defeated. Evangelism is sharing good news because good news is meant to be shared. Christ has atoned for your sins on the cross. The tomb is empty. And he reigns at the right hand of the Father for you. Amen. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank Thank you. you God bless, Ken.